different methodologies. It will be more uh, in general terms, I won't go so much in details. Uh, so I'm coming to form the Institute of Clinical Methodology on the VR. And uh, we've heard about this introduction that uh, neuromuscular disorders are diseases of the male or not unique, but the uh, sensory neuron can also be affected. So uh, motor neuron consists of motor neuron, motor neuron consists of motor neuron with all muscle fibers that it innervates. And neuromuscular disorder consists of myopathies, uh, neuropathies and neuromuscular junction disorders. You've seen this picture before about uh, motor unit being a motor neuron with all these uh, uh, muscle fibers that it innervates. In that particular part. Uh, so, just a, a more broad view about this: what uh, what uh, serving peripheral nerves? Peripheral nerves serve as a, a, a communicator of information between the central nervous system and the peripheral organs. Here we are most interested in muscles. And uh, a very interesting thought from 1924 that everything what we see uh, of people, and, uh, also animals, that is moving is just the result of muscle function. Nowadays, with this uh, advanced technology, where EEG can trigger also some, some uh, thing that people can do, this maybe uh, should need some update. So, uh, when we talk about clinical neurophysiology, uh, we always have to start with history and clinical examination. So patients with neuromuscular disorders who complain of weakness, they can be described as handicap or disability. They can talk about sensory disturbance. They can also talk about economic disturbances. So it is also useful to have a clinical uh, ways how to make a distinction between probably uh, acquired and probably hereditary disorder. And this for our hereditary neuropathy, uh, we will think about it if it is slowly progressive, if there are some uh, uh, fruit or other deformities found. And Interesting that those patients many times don't have any positive uh, uh, sensory symptoms. That means tingling, prestigia, uh, but they have clear sensory signs on uh, examination. And also, at, as I will demonstrate later, it is also important why, what kind of, of uh, abnormalities we found on nerve conduction studies. So during clinical examination, we do inspection, palpation, we do muscle strength testing uh, using MRC scale, which will tell us about pattern of involvement, and this helps us to make a differential diagnosis. Then, of course, also sensory testing is important, reflex testing, and sometimes in mildly affected patients, we need to do tests of gait or even of, of running to identify uh, small uh, uh, big, uh, abnormalities at, at the beginning. So therefore, we talk about clinical neurophysiology as an extension of clinical neurologic examination. And it consists of nerve conduction studies, of needle electromyography, and also of autonomic testing. I will not go into uh, the, the third one. I will just talk about nerve conduction studies and needle electromyography in this presentation. So clinical neurophysiology can be made, can be used for, for uh, making a diagnosis, but also for follow-up of chronic neuromuscular uh, disease patients. So why nowadays it is still important to do clinical neurophysiology? Because we still believe that apart from history and clinical examination, it still, still guides the evaluation process. So before we go to the muscle biopsy and genetics testing, it is in most patients useful to do also clinical neurophysiology. Because therefore, you've heard about genetics, what are the possibilities. But this is also a problem. I mean, the possibilities are so wide that we need to, to make it as narrow as possible by our techniques. So there are, of course, some patients that don't need nowadays to undergo clinical neurophysiological testing because this testing also has its drawbacks. One of them is that it's, uh, it's painful. Uh, so if there is a classic phenotype of a well-known uh, inherited disorder, if we have a positive family history, 
if we have a reliable genetic testing available for this, then uh, we can, uh, and, and these are for example spinal muscular atrophy, a number of muscular dystrophies, and many force, uh, uh, forms of CMT, then in these patients nowadays we don't need to go uh, and perform clinical new physiology. So uh, these techniques are uh, widely available, commercial, commercially available, and uh, when we do nerve conduction studies, uh, we, uh, we stimulate nerves and we can detect responses either from muscle, when, then we talk about motor nerve conduction studies, or from uh, nerves, then mainly we talk about sensory nerve conduction studies, although some of those nerves are mixed, and so we can detect responses also from uh, uh, muscles, uh, from uh, motor fibers. So during needle electromyography, we insert the needle into the muscle and then we observe uh, the uh, muscle uh, activity. And these are different equipment that we use in, in clinical neurophysiological laboratory. So first few words about motor nerve conduction study. The idea here is to, to stimulate motor nerve, we should know some anatomy and then we have to stimulate uh, m motor nerves at those points uh, uh, that we agree on and then uh, we uh, detect this is active and this is a reference electrode and we obtain this kind of responses and then we can measure different uh, parameters. And these parameters are uh, how long does it take from our stimulation to response uh, or, or on predetermined distance, uh, what is the amplitude of response, or so how big is this response. We can also, also measure, measure this area, and then for motor nerve conduction studies we need to stimulate on two points, and then to measure the distance, and then we can calculate from this the latency difference, also we can calculate the uh, conduction velocity. And of course this is, I've shown you, uh, 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 before this, this was for median nerve, we, we can also perform studies and many other. This is for ulnar, this is for peroneal, for tibial, and, and some other nerves as well. Then another type of studies is sensory nerve conduction studies, where we measure sensory nerve action potentials. So these are sensory nerve action potentials. We get it, as I, I told you before, this is the stimulating electrode, this is the fixed distance, and this is the detection electrode. This electrode is called the ground. This enables us to re reduce the, the artifacts and other uh, technical problems. So we stimulate here, we detect here, and then we get a response like this. And of course, uh, again, we can, we can uh, measure different parameters, and this, uh, these parameters are, again, latency, amplitude, and we can also measure conduction velocity. And we, we can perform these studies also for, for other nerves, not just for median, shown uh, uh, before. This is for radial, this is for ulnar, this is for sural uh, nerve, but many others. So, what is the use of these studies? Uh, when we found, for example, normal, uh, normal sensory nerve action potential uh, with uh, severe motor imp impairment, uh, uh, then it means that this is a purely motor condition. So that means that this, this, uh, this shortens our differential diagnosis uh, quite, quite a bit. Then if we get a small amplitude, that means this, the peripheral nerves, uh, nerves are involved uh, and, and means peripheral neuropathies. And also if we have different kinds of demyelination, uh, if it is uniform, then it's probably uh, uh, inherited. If it's not, then it's probably acquired. And so with this in mind, we can, we can, we can analyze. So the cause of muscle weakness can be first either peripheral or central then it can be uh, caused either, either due to a uh, uh, condition affecting nerves, muscle, neuromuscular junction, and if it is the, the nerves, it is just motor fibers, it is also uh, sensory fibers, and then these types, exonor or, or demyelinating and uniform, non-uniform. So this way we can really 
cut the differential diagnosis of uh, weak patient uh, considerably. So the nerve conduction studies can uh, nowadays also help us to, to build uh, uh, specific protocols which tells us what to test first. Although we have uh, hundreds of different tests, it is uh, with this in mind, it is important to go straight to the, to the right one first. And uh, another important thing that we uh, should keep in mind is that we, when we stimulate the peripheral nerve, we are actually, uh, are actually stimulating a population of uh, nerve fibers. Therefore, we have to stimulate with, uh, with strongly enough to, to uh, activate uh, all uh, uh, thick uh, nerve fibers and the amplitude of responses that we, uh, I was showing you before, that means uh, the number of bioelectrical generators. That means how many functioning uh, entities are present. And the velocity will tell us about function of myelin. So, so it mean the insulation around uh, the nerves. And, and this way we can, we can see something that we cannot see by clinical uh, examination alone. So another possibility that we have in our hands is electromyography that also uh, records muscle bioelectrical activity and it studies uh, motor units which are gener uh, uh, generators of uh, uh, bioelectric activity here are muscle fibers. So we can divide this examination, usually we first see for spontaneous activity, then uh, we can assess motor unit potentials and at last we can also see an interference pattern. And this uh, uh, data that we obtain this way, the, it, it, it uh, helps, uh, I mean, it, it, it uh, uh, completes a pattern that again tells us something about what is going on. So it, this way we can differentiate between normal myopathic and neuropathic uh, muscle as was pointed out, out before in a previous talk. So this is a concentric needle with, with the tip of the needle, and we put this into, into the muscle. So uh, when we put it in the muscle, into the, the healthy muscle, we get response like this. We call it uh, insertion activity. When something is wrong, so uh, 10 to 20 days, uh, uh, this insertion activity can become pathologic. So we get some p potentials uh, called positive sharp waves and, and uh, fibrillations that tells us that this muscle is, uh, was going uh, uh, process of denervation. And uh, uh, later there are also some other responses that we can uh, obtain. Uh, one of them is called complex repetitive uh, discharges. Uh, so this was the uh, observation of, of spontaneous activity in the muscle provoked by a movement of our needle, but we can also make a voluntary activation. First, uh, one uh, motor unit uh, comes in and then it fires with a uh, uh, high frequency and then other uh, jumps in and so on. This is called the recruitment pattern. The important thing with the first part of this study is to, to uh, look at motor unit potentials and motor unit potentials uh, is, is this, I've shown you uh, uh, before, and uh, it is actually made by summation from individual muscle fibers. Therefore, changes of motor unit potential reflect changes in anatomy or microanatomy of uh, motor unit fibers. This is the information that we can get this way. So when we have a normal uh, um, uh, checkerboard, a mosaic uh, pattern in the muscle, we will get a normal motor unit potential. Uh, it, was, it was shown before uh, and talked about process of collateral renovation. When one of these motor uh, units dies, the other takes over, meaning that uh, the concentration of, of fibers that, uh, uh, that are supported by the same uh, motor uh, unit is bigger. The, uh, uh, I mean, it's higher concentration and therefore the, uh, this motor unit potential is also bigger. And this is the anatomy that was discussed before behind this. Uh, uh, and this is the in uh, myopathic proce process, don't know which uh, motor unit is which, and therefore it's, the, the muscle fibers 
uh, they atrophy and degenerate indiscriminately, and therefore the number of mortar units is more or less the same, but they are of, of uh, the generators uh, uh, are reduced in number and in amplitude, and this is the myopathic uh, response. So this, is, this was be what we get on our study. We have to sa sample on quantitative MG uh, more than 20 potentials. We have reference limits. We have also uh, this kind uh, of, of presentation, graphic presentation, and this tells us everything more or less is, is green. That's, that's normal. On the other side, we have big potentials, so collateral uh, renovation, everything is towards uh, higher duration, higher amplitude, so this is a neuropathic process. On the other side, in myopathy, these potentials can be very small, uh, meaning that everything is going to low duration, low amplitude, which is uh, typical for myopathy. So we can also uh, observe interference pattern. This is the normal interference pattern. This is the reduced. I explained before that number of motor units available in, in neurogenic disorder is reduced. Therefore, and, and those that remain uh, due to pro process of collateral renovation take over and become bigger. And here, due to uh, uh, degeneration of muscle fibers, myopathic pattern uh, becomes smaller. A uh, few words about motor neuro neuron disorders. So we need both of these uh, to establish diagnosis of motor neuron disease. And you can have sporadic and hereditary. You can have more upper and more lower motor neuron. And uh, there are different names that goes with this. And we will find these muscles uh, denervation activity and neurogenic changes. On the other side, we can also tell much about uh, myopathy. So for some, some myopathies uh, curiously have completely normal EMG. Others will have myopathic MUPs with fibrillation potentials. Others, we, again, will have myopathic uh, changes of motor neuron potentials only. Uh, it's just fibrillation. Then myotonia with uh, myopathic MUPs and myotonia. So again, we can cut these uh, myopathic uh, changes also to this difference uh, pattern. We also studied uh, a little of this, and uh, we studied uh, uh, facio scapulo humeral muscular dystrophy. And the interesting thing was, was that we found that in 77% of completely normal strength muscle, we were able to find myopathic changes on quantitative EMG, while all weak muscles were, were pathologic. So a quite useful uh, techniques. So what about following uh, patients with progressive neuromuscular disease? So the most important, I think, is clinical evaluation, is using questionnaires, uh, muscle strength testing, and so on. Then it's also useful to, to, you, to have some scoring uh, systems that can document uh, 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 the, the, uh, the impairment uh, uh, on time basis and following patients. But clinical neurophysiology also have its place. Because, uh, for example, neuroge neurogenic changes and muscle fiber hypertrophy try to preserve uh, muscle strength. This is, uh, as we, we heard before, compensatory uh, system. So when we get very abnormal EMG, that is often not a bad thing. Because that means that something is going on. It's not just falling off. So some uh, compensation is going on. And this is, uh, however, that the, those patients would usually have rather good strength. So this is something that is easier to, to, uh, to, do the, to find clinical neurophysiology uh, than or with clinical testing. Uh, because those patients that don't have this, uh, they, have, uh, uh, they have nicer neurophysiology on, on first sight, but they usually will be weaker with faster disease progression. So this is one such patient uh, who, who has typical myopathy, uh, but uh, a lot of big uh, the neurogenic looking potentials due to a, a hypertrophy of, of some of uh, his fibers. So this is, uh, this is uh, more or less end stage uh, myopathy. 
uh, that can be uh, very tricky sometimes. So to conclude that neuromuscular disorders have traditionally been overlooked, underdiagnosed and poorly treated when compared with neurological diseases with greater visibility like Parkinson's disease or epilepsy with greater social impact like dementias and higher mortality like brain tumors or meningitis. However, they are diverse and extremely common. And we think that they cover about 40% of neurological diagnosis and they can lead to the significant disability and even death. So the accurate and early diagnosis uh, of course may lead to effective treatment, reduction in disability, improvement in quality of life and clinical neurophysiology tries to help uh, with this. So thank you very much.